Today we are going to continue our discussion of research methods used in psychology. And yesterday we looked at experiments and correlational studies. Today we're going to look at the rest of these research methods. Again, something that you have to keep in mind is that researchers are going to choose a research method that is going to help them to best answer their research question. You're also going to see that at times researchers are going to combine research methods as well. The first method that we're going to talk about today is naturalistic observation. Now underline, circle, highlight that word natural. It's going to be really important. So naturalistic observation is a method where researchers are going to observe a subject in their natural setting. So naturalistic, so naturalistic, natural setting. And then the big key here is without interfering. So an example of how this is used in animals, Jane Goodall, you might have heard of her in her research with chimps, she used naturalistic observation in observing chimps eat, play, mate, sleep, and again they're in their natural surroundings. So that means that she didn't interact with them, she just observed them. An example of where naturalistic observation can be used with people, people can be observed in their workplaces, homes, playgrounds. If you remember back to our discussion on ethics in psychology, it has to be a public place and other, otherwise then a person has to get informed consent. And again, so you're observing a subject without interfering. So if you're watching someone on a playground, that doesn't mean that means that you cannot go and join in on the fun. Next, we have case studies. Case studies are going to be intensive study of a person or group. Most case studies, like I said, are going to combine long-term observations, diaries, tests, interviews, and a famous case study that we'll actually talk about more in our next unit is about someone named Phineas Gage and I spared you from a picture today. He was in a railroad accident. He was driving spikes for the railroad and in an accident the railroad spike was driven through his head, through his frontal lobe, so through his eye and um, up through the top of his head. If you'd like you can Google a picture. And what researchers found is that his personality changed because he did survive <laughs> from before the accident to after the accident his personality changed and so that led them to believe that that frontal lobe governs our personality so what's unique about a case study is that it can't be duplicated usually a result of some type of accident or unique situation where researchers are going to take advantage of it and study it of course we can't sign up ask for participants to sign up to get a railroad spike driven through their head so that we can ask for, so that we can see what happens. So that's what makes a case study unique. Next, a survey. I think we're all pretty familiar with a survey. A survey could consist of interviews, so face-to-face -face interactions with people, or it could consist of questionnaires. So even if it was face-to-face -face, it would still remain anonymous the people's names wouldn't be used but they would still be asked the same questions in person as if they were as the same questions as if they were taking it on a piece of paper so an, an advantage of a survey is that a lot of data can be collected at one time So an example of this is surveying teens about their attitudes on tobacco use. So people are going to have to report their attitudes. Next, looking at longitudinal studies. Here I want you to underline, circle, or highlight that word long. That's going to be important in the definition. Longitudinal studies, this is a research method in which one participant or a group of participants is studied over a long period 
of time. So it's the same person or the same group of people studied over a long period of time. See the longitudinal long? So again, the same participants are studied at various ages to determine age-related changes. So an example, and again, it's the same group of people. In this first study that happened in 1965, they worked with 20-year-old participants. In the next round, 20 years later, in study two in 1985, they again worked with the same participants now at 40 years old. And then in the third study, again 20 years later, the same participants are now 60 years old. So let's say they were looking at mental functioning of these same people. So how did their mental functioning compare to when they were 20, to when they were 40, to when they were 60? Another study that just came to mind is they can use longitudinal studies to study married couples. So how is this group of married couples doing on year one of their marriage? Okay, let's check back in with those same couples at year five and year ten and measure things like satisfaction with the relationship and things like that. So same participants at different times. Now cross-sectional. Cross-sectional and longitudinal are often confused. I'm hoping to clear up any confusion. So cross-sectional is a method in which data is collected from specific age groups at one time. So if you've ever heard of taking a cross-section, that just means a slice where you can see different pieces in one place. So data is collected from specific age groups at one time. So these are going to be different participants of various ages. And they're going, the different age groups are going to be compared to determine age-related differences. So let's say we are looking at the IQ scores of 20-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and 60-year-olds. So we're comparing the IQ scores of 20-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 60-year-olds. This is all done in at one time, one specific time. So that would be, let's say that was in 2005. Where if we look at longitudinal, this is the same participants at different times. This one is different participants at one time. So they want to see how is the IQ score of a 20 year old versus a 40 year old versus a 60 year old. As you can imagine, they want to see if there's any differences between these groups because they clearly have different life experiences, they have different education levels. They want to see compare the differences. All right. The last thing that I would like for you to do is take a moment to determine which research method is being used here. So you can choose from, they're going back to yesterday too, experiment, correlational study, naturalistic observation, case study, survey, longitudinal study, and cross-sectional study. So take some time to go ahead and, in a moment, you're going to pause this and read through each statement and write down which research method. Again, doing your best. Refer back to your notes, compare them to these, and just do your best. And then I've also included the key so that you can check your answers. That way you can come to class with your questions. Oh, so I missed this one and I don't understand why. And we're going to get some more practice tomorrow looking at some other examples and also doing some matching of definitions and classifying other examples. So go ahead and pause. And then when you're done, check your answers. Make sure you check. You need It's good practice. All right. Once you're done, unpause. And right now I'm going to go ahead and switch to the key so that you can look at that. And then you can pause it there. So number one was cross-sectional, two, naturalistic observation, three, experiment, four, survey, five, case study, six, correlational study. So again, come with your questions. And you can pause this and check your answers. All right. 
Have a good night. Come with your questions.